Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. Hello, and welcome back to the Exodus Cry podcast. Today we have with us special guest Andrea Hines, who is a survivor of the sex industry in Canada, including escorting and brothels. And she is now a prostitution abolitionist and Nordic equality model advocate. Um, in this episode, she shares with us her powerful story and insights uh, with us in detail. And we are so grateful to have her join us. So I uh, hope you enjoy this podcast. So starting out, I would love to hear a little bit of your perspective on the fight against trafficking that's happening in Canada. Oh, um, well, I think with that, there's a lot of crossover between trafficking and just commercial sexual exploitation. So I think a lot of the times people are very, very focused on solely trafficking, and they're not recognizing that trafficking occurs for the purposes of prostitution. Sex trafficking occurs for those purposes. So there's a very uh, strong public denunciation of sex trafficking, and there's a lot of attention being paid to that, a lot of uh, task force, a lot of money being put towards that, but then we stop short and we don't continue on to say, what is driving the demand to this? Why is this occurring? How can we actually combat this? It, mm -hmm. it seems to be a lot of Band-Aid solutions and a lot of superficial conversations. So I think people just have to dig deeper and start looking into prostitution as a cause of trafficking and, and go from there, really. I'm glad that you brought that up because I think the bigger picture question is not so much about how did somebody get into prostitution, but what is their experience of it once they're in? Because there, you're right, there is a lot of categorizing going on. Um, of, well, this is trafficking, but this is people doing it voluntarily. Um, this is people who are forced. These are people who are chose this. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe some of those distinctions um, uh, are true in certain situations, but a more compelling way to understand this larger issue is the experience of all people in the system of the commercial sex industry regardless of how they got there. And I think that's something that you give a lot of help understanding because of your experience. And maybe you can even talk about a little bit of your background and how, how you're looking at this issue now and how you approach it. Sure, thank you. Um, well, as I said, I think the hot topic now is trafficking. So I think in some ways I'm a little bit of a niche in not focusing solely on trafficking. Mm -hmm. I never was trafficked or third party exploited. So my sole experience is strictly just prostitution. And um, I just find that uh, in some ways it's, it's challenging because again, it goes back to like what you said with that compartmentalization. People like things packaged very neatly. They like things very black and white. It's easy to make sense of it in that regard. And when you start getting into things, the notion of autonomy and agency in these overall structures of exploitation, that's where it's really hard to start pulling things apart. And that's where people get uncomfortable and where it's, uh, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. And they want that quick answer. They want that quick fix. Right. And so, yeah, that's, that's a struggle definitely is trying to, as I said, just bring it back to the root cause, which is, you know, the male demand for, for women's bodies just on demand. Absolutely. And there does seem to be this, um, I don't know if it's a conscious or unconscious effort to identify the one person, you know, in their mind's eye who has done this willingly to divorce themselves from any responsibility to do anything about the larger issues. So there's kind of this general tacit acceptance of the commercial sex industry as quote unquote, the world's oldest profession on and on. And that status quo narrative is perpetuated by people's ability to find some anomaly, some, you know, the college girl who decided to pay her way through school, you know, all the examples that we hear. And again, that brings me back to like, okay, so even in that situation, 
how does that person experience this? Because I guess the thing that I sometimes wrestle with is just a person's choice of something doesn't make the acceptance of it any better. In other words, I can accept somebody's choice of something, but it doesn't change the way they, the way they experience it as of an injustice or as a form of violation or as a form of exploitation, you know, for people who are struggling and grinding poverty in countries that will employ people in sweatshops to work for a dollar and 50 cents to, for a 15 hour day, they may have chosen to go into that job, but their experience of it is still one that is um, intrinsically, existentially violating to their humanity. It is taking advantage of, it is a grueling, cruel injustice to those people. So I think for me, like that's, I, I would really love to hear more of your insight about how a person experiences prostitution, regardless if they've chosen it or not, to deal with that demographic of people who would say, well, they chose it. And so, um, you know, this is the world's oldest profession. It's just kind of the way things are, as opposed to, you know, there's this system, this large system of prostitution that is, um, destroying systematically the lives of everyone who enters it. And regardless of somebody who chose it or not, we have to do something about it. Now you're getting to the point of demand, which I'd love to explore that with you as well. But just because of your unique history related to this issue, uh, if there's anything that any insight that you can give to the way people experience prostitution, despite whether or not they've chosen it would I think be super helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think so much of what you said is so on point and so powerful. And I think that's in a very, uh, I think that's a very evolved position to hold because that takes time to come to that realization that we're not talking about singular events, about individuals, we're talking about a structure and a system. And uh, that takes a zoom out approach that requires that. And a lot of people, we, we live in this hyper individualized world where we are very uh, micro focused on things and we're just operating in our little bubble and we're not actually stepping back and kind of observing the world at large and these things that we're we're doing en masse mm -hmm. so um and, and i was guilty of that as well too when i entered into prostitution i like i said i wasn't trafficked uh, or third party exploited but i had sixty thousand dollars of debt of of commercial debt that was incurred largely um based on financial illiteracy youth and inexperienced lack of education and skills and also uh, a series of financially abusive relationships so when i look back now at the time i thought this is my choice i'm choosing to do this it's not a choice i want to make but you know no one's putting a gun to my head and and i fell privy to a lot of those larger social narratives that you, that you spoke of and uh, it took a long time for me to realize and in some ways, I didn't even really realize it until after I exited that there never really was a choice. It was a decision. And that came about with um, a feminist mentor of mine, the woman who actually gave me my job, my first job when I exited prostitution. I had said something along the lines of having chose it. And she said, but did you choose it or did you decide to do it? And that was really like this, you know, whoa moment for me because I had never zoomed out on that approach and looked at it again as a system rather than an individual occurrence or event. Mm. So I think that when you're in that moment, um, and, and several survivors have said this, you can't experience the full depth of what you are uh, involved in because to do that is spiritual suicide. It's it's the death of every bit of, of you that is optimistic, joyful, uh, happy to wake up every day, no matter what we do and no matter what situation we're in, we try to be happy and we try to be successful in it and all the things that everybody wants for a fulfilled life. But when you're in these systems of exploitation, it doesn't come naturally, obviously. It's it's not innate to it. They're abusive. They're uh, demeaning, dehumanizing, 
all these things that you have to build this shield around yourself to block your your core being from experiencing that. But wasn't it sexually liberating and empowering? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When well, I hear people say that, I just, I, I've read enough and listened to enough survivors that I just, I cringe when I hear people mm -hmm. try to package prostitution as something liberating, empowering. That's about this college student who was just so sexual and had a little bit of bills to pay mm -hmm. and you know as opposed to somebody who's enduring the offloaded existential psychic rage anger perversity hopelessness and despair onto another person who has no choice but to receive it because payment has been made to rent their body like i just the injustice of the very act of prostitution being packaged as something empowering, liberating is so infuriating to me. Yeah. And so I, I would love to hear more of your thoughts around that. Like you had your experience, which if I'm hearing you correctly, you're describing as almost having created this like cover narrative to survive the experience. Um, but then coming out from it, we're able to like better reflect on and process your own journey of, of what happened. How does it strike you now? Because you're very active in this space and you, you're you on Twitter. Um, I commend you for your courage for staying on Twitter. Um, I, <laughs> Thank I you. had a bounce um, a while back. Um, but uh, like when the when it's packaged this way and, and people and you're told, you know, this is liberating, this is empowering, this is a human right, this is, you know, all these other things. How do you filter that? How does that, strike you offensive it's it's really offensive um i see it as an additional layer of dismissal so when you're in prostitution you're dismissed by the buyer you're seen as an object not as a person you're reduced in every facet of your being and then when you exit and you finally um aren't under the the delusion, I guess, of the money, the the conditioning of, you know, the ideology and swimming in the sea of it, you finally want people to see you because now you can say the things that you could never say and mm -hmm. you could be honest and completely bare your soul. And I think a lot of the people that come at exited women and survivors and try to be dismissive, I think that deep down they do know that we're right and that what we are experiencing is the truth and that we're speaking that truth. And I think that they feel threatened by that, likely because they are sex consumers or pornography consumers in some type of way. And to them, that's a threat of, you know, you're speaking truth to power and you will mm. take away how I uh, release my own anger, how I, you know, fulfill my own shortcomings. And none of it is healthy, obviously, like right. where they are and what they're doing to make up for what they're lacking is is harming them but they can't see that so we become the enemy instead of what is inside of them that is destroying them and so they come at us and and so it's very frustrating but i think once you can see that you can realize it's a desperate attempt to discredit someone for your own personal gain so it used to really bother me when i first exited i i was like how can they not see this how can they say this to me and now I'm just like, oh, okay, here's the fourth person today on Twitter right. <laughs> that has said it to me. And, you know, you never, I, I don't want to say you get used to it, but you expect it. And the sad thing is for non-thinking people or even people who pretend to be thinking people, we want to accept that narrative. There's some deeper underlying misogyny, <laughs> uh, some deeper underlying force that is compelling people to want to believe the fantasy of that lie. And um, that, that's, I think, just a whole other, you know, part of this to, to unpack. But something I wanted to ask you about is, in, you know, in my experience of, of talking with survivors and, and researching and studying this issue for so long, it's, it seems to be a very common almost universal um, occurrence or experience of people in prostitution to sort of create this cover narrative that they live under to survive the experience. A lot of dissociation happening as a part of that. Um, and, and then for those who have been able to exit and had time to heal 
um, discovering a different perspective and, and way of understanding and, um, and going back to those moments of violation, I would be really curious to hear what that was like for you. And specifically, I'm going to, I know I'm giving a lot of kind of context for this question. Um, Rachel Morin talks about the sensitivity of our sexual spirit, the fragility of it. So that even like an expressed urge can feel violating to our sexual serenity. And, um, and so she, she talks about that as a way to sort of magnify or amplify the tsunami of exploitation that is experienced in prostitution. And I'm curious for you, having had to, in a way, almost like survive for so long and, and compartmentalize and dissociate and like keep yourself together. Was there a moment where you began to identify with those places of violation in almost like a compassionate, self-loving, gentle and kind way with yourself? Like, wow, that was awful. Like what that person did to, and, and previously maybe not able to face that. Was there a moment where those kinds of things were able to happen where you were able to kind of identify with some of the violation that occurred and, and to grieve those, those things. It was a journey definitely to get to that point. And I appreciate everything that you said, cause it, you know, exactly what I think uh, women endure. And I think you're so um, well versed and, you know, inclusive in this area of talking to so many different people that I really trust that you, you understand what we go through and I appreciate that so much. And I think for me, um, I, I've talked about it before, but I said like when I was in the room with those men, I would almost float outside of my body. And it was sort of like, as they were there on top of me, I would move about six inches outside of my body. And it was mm -hmm. like, I was laying there watching myself have sex with this man or, or sorry, have, watch this man have sex with me. And, um, I would talk normally. I would smile and say all the things that I had to say. I'd go through my my spiel, um, but I wasn't in my physical body. So that's, again, going back to the dissociation that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that's so characteristic of all forms of sexual abuse, not just in prostitution. Because again, if we're in our body, if we feel those touches, if we smell those smells, if all those things are really hitting home in us, we can't get through that moment and we can't repeatedly do that when we need to. So when you do that so many times, it, it becomes very natural to do it. Mm. And I found that even whenever I wasn't in the room with a man, I would go into these floating and dissociative states where everything in my life was marred by not feeling. And it was all observing. It was all intellectual. It was all just mm. headspace. And then I realized that that was making me very um, cold and numb. And I didn't feel like I had that human spirit in me. I felt like a person, but not like a, a spiritual entity, like a, a human. I felt just like this person of bones and flesh, but nothing more to me. And so uh, that really impacted a lot of other areas in my life, like my marriage, uh, parenting my three children, everything was very methodical and intellectualized and, and things like that. And there wasn't these moments where I ever actually really felt like true joy and mm. true enjoyment and, and all these other human emotions and experiences that you know you should be feeling, but for some reason you're just not reaching those depths of yourself. So um, it was probably about, I think, seven years after I exited prostitution and, and I had been speaking out as an advocate against it for seven years that I realized like, okay, it's, it's some benefit to staying in your mind because you're not feeling um, re-triggered. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not feeling any of those things where, you know, it's really going to um, complicate or compromise your advocacy. 
But then whenever it comes down to reaching people on that human to human level, you're falling short on that. So that was where, you know, I realized, okay, my marriage is not doing so well. I'm not probably the most emotionally connected parent I could be. Mm. Um, I'm saying all these academic things and I'm reaching people in the head space, but how am I going to reach them in the heart space if I can't even reach myself there? So that was when I kind of realized, I think I need to go to therapy. And people had been telling me to do that for many years, but, you know, we have this mindset of, no, I've you know, gone through it in my mind so many times, I've pulled it all apart, like what's a therapist gonna say to me that right. I haven't asked myself already? So starting therapy really um, was difficult for me because it forced me to get out of that headspace and get into the heart space. And as you said, start looking back on those experiences. And instead of thinking what happened, you're thinking, how did that make me feel when that happened? And it was very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable, but probably the best thing I did because um, now I feel like I, I, I'm i gentler and I'm more well-rounded mm -hmm. in how I connect with people on this issue. But I also do find that now it's a little bit more challenging for me emotionally. You know, I'd live on Twitter before and I'd just be talking about the issue. Now I'll tweet something and sometimes someone will reply something and I'll get all teary-eyed and I'm like, oh, that hit me right in the feels. <laughs> Whereas before, I. I didn't even know I, I had that space for people to hit me there. So it was very uh, challenging, but rewarding, but still a journey that I'm going through. Are, are there any moments that you can share with us or just about like what some of those feelings were? Like what, what were some of the feelings that began to come up for you as you kind of sat in that safe space with a therapist, um, reflecting on your own journey? Um, Anything? Vulnerability, definitely. Like letting the shield down. And my therapist said as well too, like to me, she said, you, you always wanna go back to this like feminist argument. <laughs> and you know, talking about misogyny, talking about patriarchy, talking about all these things. But she said, let's take it down to the bare bones of human and human. You know, it was you and another human. And, and the interaction between you two like is not um, yeah, it has a societal impact. Like there's that social imprint that has led them to act a certain way or led you to act a certain way. But in that moment when it's just human and human naked with each other, how did they treat you? You know, how did they make you feel? Like forget everything else of what brought them there. But in that moment, how was that with that fellow human? And so it was very, um, it was sad. It was really sad because then you can see just how broken a lot of these individuals that do exploit people are and we're very quick to vilify them and i'm not by any means trying to take away any accountability that should be placed upon them for what they're doing to exploiting women um but it was it was really just compassion i think is what i hmm. felt whereas a lot of the times you have to dehumanize that man too you have to uh, see him as your paycheck because if you truly saw him as a human for all he is um, you would struggle to, to you know, enable his self harm as well. Hmm. You know, even though he is harming you in that moment. That's surprising. It's surprising to hear that that's what came up for you. I, I would have thought like feeling like I wanted to kill all those men, you know, or like <laughs> something like that. Like it's 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 really interesting to hear that as you kind of began to excavate those deeper places of those feelings and, and how you experience this, that what would come up as, as grief and sadness for the, the men who were exploiting you and, and your own experience of that. Yeah. I think that's a very like compassionate and humanizing way to look at it. Part of where my mind goes, well, it goes to two places. One is, like you said, there still does need to be accountability for these men. I, I love men. <laughs> you know, I, I don't love a lot of the behavior that I see common today among men. Um, and so how do we help to curb some of this behavior, which really is at the root of all commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking? But before we get to that, I, I'd love to just lean a little bit more into anything else that may have 
come up for you as you were able to kind of sit in that space uh, and reflect of like, yeah, just what those feelings were that yeah, well, when you said, you know, I would have suspected anger, there was definitely anger too. But um, I, I don't know. I think every time that I feel anger for them, it's also anger for, you know, the larger system. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, again, we condition men into becoming sex consumers. You know, we, we know that men, boys are consuming pornography at very young age. You know, it's tied to this notion of hyper-masculinity, this consumption of women, um, you know, the whole uh, domineering energy. And so there was definitely moments of anger. And I, I think I've probably shown that a couple times on Twitter where I've like kind of rage vented something, but mm -hmm. the anger is very quickly replaced by just pity, truly. And uh, looking at everybody who's a part of that entire system as someone who has been conditioned to be there, because I don't think that buyers are um, innately that way. I think that, you know, men are, are loving, they're peaceful. And I think a lot of uh, things that just drive um, them to the industry are are not characteristic of who they really are. And I don't think that they actually want to be there. Mm -hmm. And I think I've had the opportunity to um, be fortunate, more fortunate than a lot of exited women in that I speak to a lot of uh, active sex buyers at our sex trade offender program, our John School in Edmonton. And I've been speaking to those men for 10 years. So they are, you know, freshly arrested and, and they come there very angry and kind of saying, well, I didn't do anything wrong. Like, you know, going back on the whole, just helping out a college girl, pay her tuition. She chose it, told me she liked it. And it's such a vulnerable space to sit with them there. And uh, the transformation that I've been fortunate to witness when you can see that happen, it's very hard to hold anger for people. When you can see them detailing their loneliness and their depression and their confusion about how they should be as a man, what defines them as a man, you you want to help people rather than uh, kind of come down on them and browbeat them. So mm -hmm. I think that's probably been a blessing that I had that opportunity immediately after exiting prostitution was to meet with men and be able to tell them my truth in that moment when every other time I couldn't. So that was very cathartic for me and, and I didn't really feel like I had to resort to anger to then express that to them. But you know, I know a lot of survivors, they don't have that opportunity to face men one-on-one -on -one like that in those vulnerable, intimate settings. Mm -hmm. And many of them probably don't want to, which I completely understand. But I think that there's just, it doing so brings you back to that human element mm -hmm. every time. And once you see that and, and it's human to human, you kind of forget about everything else that, um, you know, differentiates us. And so, you know, love is always the answer. And I know it's so hard in this space to always loop back to that because we want someone to blame. We want to fix a problem and a problem usually has a source. But when you can kind of see how interwoven it all is and how much delusion exists and uh, how we're failing people, men and women, and, and we're so hyper-individualized, we're so, um, you know, uh, money-driven, like we're just, we've lost our way as people. We've mm -hmm. lost what really brings us together and that's love. And so when you keep going back to that, there's just something very freeing about that, that you don't carry that anger the same that you would if you were alone and isolated and left with your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How has that played a role in your own healing journey? It's It's been a gift. Like, I won't lie, there's been times where after I speak at the John School, I go home and I'm not okay for about two days after because it's it's ripping the scab. You never let that wound heal. You're just repeatedly ripping it and bleeding out in front of people. But, you know, the transformation I've seen, that is then what heals me. Because I know, like, okay, I may not reach every man. You know, there's going to be people that, that don't resonate with my story or don't see me as human. And they're not at that stage yet of their humanity and their connection and deepening of love. But for those men that I have reached... Like I still get emails from some of them, you know, uh, periodically five years after a John school and they say, I'm just giving you an update. I haven't consumed any pornography. I, I haven't purchased sex with women. I've 
you know, gone to marital counseling with my wife. Things are much better. I'm happier. So many of them say that um, that even though they enter there very angry, you know, kind of like I said, why am I here? You know, I shouldn't be vilified. They all, for the most part, when they leave, see it as a gift, mm -hmm. the, the education and the truth. And so many of them say, I had no clue. Like had someone actually given me the truth, I don't think I would have done this. Um, you know, some of them, of course, are dealing with sex addiction sure. and, and that overrides anything for them until they get help. But so many people, I think, are just conditioned. And when you can be honest with them, you break that. And then that's where the the truth, you know, you can't deny the truth. It's out in the open. And then it's, do you willfully want to deny that truth or can you accept it and be the bigger person and change your ways? Mm -hmm. And most of them do. So that encourages me and, and that's healed me. That's really been rewarding. And I think without the John School opportunity, I don't know if I'd be as calm <laughs> as I am. I think there'd be a lot more anger because I wouldn't have an outlet or a way to speak my truth to the people that are, are you know, part of the system and part of the harm that women are experiencing. Most kids have been exposed to pornography by age 13. Some are addicted even as young as six. So how is pornography shaping the lives of impressionable children and adolescents? Our documentary, Raised on Porn, exposes the ways pornography has become the new sex education for children and unpacks the dangerous lifelong implications of this global phenomenon. I was like, this is my chance of actually getting pornography for myself. The film features real stories of childhood exposure paired with experts who weigh in on the reality children are facing. It's absolutely impossible for them to resist this kind of stimulus. It's already garnered millions of views and 93% of viewers polled said it inspired them to be more proactive in protecting their children from porn. You can watch Raised on Porn for free on YouTube or go to raisedonporn.com. The healing journey, having survived something like prostitution, uh, I'm sure, sure has so many layers of complexity to it. Um, and uh, it is, again, something that we maybe try to oversimplify, to wrap a bow around, like, well, they chose this about, you know, but at the end of the day, like we all are these humans that were created for love and are in a way, yes, there's a simplicity to that. Like, you know, it's as simple as we were created for love, but there's also a complexity to our composition as humans, like spiritually, intellectually, mentally, ex our experiences, our histories, our, our physical experience of the world. Um, all of those things, like our life experience is complicated. And I think whenever we have experienced something that is violating of that experience, the, the path towards healing has um, a, many challenges to it. Um, so uh, I, I really appreciate your testimony of how that interaction with this demographic of men who represented in a way almost like your abusers um actually became part of your own healing journey was there any other like obstacles that you faced along the way that you can recall that um felt like they were opposing your healing or things that came up that you had to work through to continue down that path of healing. I mean, it seems like today you're in such a peaceful, healed, whole, composed place in life. And I, I know that's not the journey for everyone who has experienced, you know, that those, um, violations, let's say of their humanity. Uh, what, is there anything else that you can speak to about your healing journey and well, I appreciate that you you uh, believe or um, assume, I guess, that uh, I'm fully healed because I, I like to think I'm closer to that, but I um, can't remember exactly who said it. Uh, oh, I guess it would have been Andrea Dworkin. And she said, you know, you, you won't find a whole woman 
during prostitution and after prostitution, we never get whole again. And I always thought, no, okay, you do. There is a point where you recover from these things. Mm. But mm. I've also talked to women who have, um, who are in their 50s and 60s and were sexually abused even once, twice, three times in their life. So not even thousands of times like so many of us in prostitution were. And those women still are not fully healed. There's something very unique about sexual abuse that sets it apart from other forms of abuse. Hmm. And and I often think it goes back to that dissociation and how that just breaks a person and um, doesn't mean that you can't rebuild in a new way and that you can't be a different, possibly even better version of yourself, but you are left with a fragmented identity. So there is you before the abuse, there is you during that abuse, and then you after that abuse has to somehow merge all of those things together and incorporate that abuse into your new identity. And, you know, people have often kind of said to me, well, you know, now it's been 10 years, you should be over it. You know, you weren't trafficked, you weren't third party exploited. So why is it so problematic for you? You, you know, you, you've made decent money. It's not like you were, you know, selling sex for $10. Like mm -hmm. you were always in these fancy brothels and you were always making top dollar within Edmonton sex trade. And this is all true, but I, th I think that that reminds me that it doesn't matter what tier, so to speak, you are operating on. Uh, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. And Norma Hoddling, the woman in San Francisco who's uh, now deceased, but she's basically the woman who created the concept of John Schools. She had once famously said, it doesn't matter if, and pardon my language, but these are her words, it doesn't matter if you're sucking dick uh, behind a dumpster or you're sucking dick in the penthouse suites of like the Ritz Carlton, you are still sucking dick. When I heard her say that, it was very, very affirming because so often I think whenever you are in these upper echelons of the commercial sex industry, you're very readily dismissed, not only by society who sees you as privileged, which I have a hard time tying that word to being exploited no matter where you operate, but you're also sometimes um, judged and treated poorly by those at the lower levels mm. of prostitution because they say, you know, how dare you say that you were harmed when you made money, I didn't. How dare you say that you were harmed when you weren't trafficked, I was. So there is obviously this continuum of agency and of victimization that happens, but we tend to dismiss those who are on these upper echelons of this as people who are not worthy of any degree of compassion. And that, again, feeds into what you said about like the college student and mm -hmm. these so-called privileged individuals that we, we like to pull out and use as an example of why it's so miraculously wonderful and things like that, but it, it's not. So I think that has been challenging for me is having people dismiss me um, as, and I don't want to say not a victim because I, I don't identify as a victim, um, but just sort of saying you have no room to cry like you chose that that was your life you you know did better than most so you know that's that's the part that still continues to invalidate you know my feelings a lot of the time mm. i like what you the distinction that you made between choosing and deciding i think that's i've never heard that before i think that's a, a helpful distinction um I've heard it said a lot of different ways, but prostitution is a choice for those with the fewest choices is another way I've heard it said. Um, my thinking about this has always been about how do you qualify the choice of somebody who, and then fill in the blank, you know, and life comes at you fast. It comes and there's so many difficult challenges and responsibilities that come with life. You know, we go from it in most cases, a relatively sheltered existence as children. And then you have your 18th birthday and you know, it's now it's sink or swim mm -hmm. and, you know, and people experience the world to varying degrees of vulnerability with that. But the very fact that we live in this predatory, exploitative world of its own presents an enormous challenge to navigating that life as an adult. So you start to put on debt, homelessness, 
you know, maybe some child sexual abuse, the substance to cope with that. You start layering those vulnerabilities in and then somebody says, I'm going to go try this. And then society says, oh, well, you've chosen that. It's this way of disowning our own responsibility for um, the more vulnerable demographic of people in our world and the systems that exist to prey upon and exploit them for personal gratification and gain. And um, that's, that's, it's, that's really troubling. It's, 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 it's a really troubling thing to look at. But part of what I appreciate about having conversations like this is just the opportunity to humanize um, the individuals who have been in this um, to help give more understanding to people and hopefully begin to create change. But with regards to that specific like framework, the the verbiage of I decided this versus I I chose this, it's like I think again of that analogy of somebody who um you know at what point does the person working in a sweatshop maybe come out of that life and maybe begin to realize that their experience of the sweatshop wasn't all good. Now, of course, intrinsically they know that, but they had to tell themselves that it was okay for a while to be doing it. At what point do they be able to go back and say, okay, well, yeah, I decided this and my participation in it is part of the challenge or the shame of actually being able to fully own um, a more empathetic understanding of the way in which something was actually taken from me. So yeah, I decided to do this. That doesn't change the fact that the people who should have known better were still taking something from me. And I still, still experienced it that way when I was in it. I think for me, like part of my hope in having conversations like this is for people to really understand that in a deeper way. And I think you've done a great job of providing that perspective, like just through your work and your messaging. And um, so um, I wanted to ask you about the indigenous populations of Canada and how they're being affected by this. But before we get to that, was there any, anything else that you want to share on kind of this theme that we've been rapping about? I think it's hard to get people to um, drop the language of choice. And so that's where I felt very blessed that my, my mentor gave me that distinction of decision. Don't even use the word choice. There was no choice. It was a decision based on a lack of choice. But I think uh, socially we're not there yet because we still want to ascribe agency to people. So even if we go back to saying it was a choice, we can say that was a constrained choice. So there's so many ways to look at it where it's not this cut and dry, compartmentalized, you know, it was a choice. Yeah. So it's really about, I guess, however you can reach that person to um, explain to them that there is there is really a difference between a choice, like you said, you know, and, and going to resigning yourself to something because of lack of choice. So yeah, language is very, very tricky. And I'm always kind of examining that and pulling that apart because I think it's also very powerful. Language has the ability to dismiss things or it has the ability to really open people's eyes. Yeah. And certain things that I've said, I I stop after and I say, oh, had I worded that differently, people probably would have perceived that differently. So that's the hard part is shifting that. And so much of that also comes back to labor language. That's probably one of the things that I try to combat the most is uh, sex work ideology, this concept that it can be a form of work to be sexually exploited. Mm. Because I think if we actually switched and stopped using these terms, sex worker, sex work, um, client, you know, all these things that we've seen um, come about since the 1980s, we would see it differently because we didn't have, I don't think from, and don't get me wrong, I was 
born in the 80s, so I missed everything prior. But from my understanding of speaking to uh, elder feminists, we didn't have the support for prostitution that we have now. We didn't have people excusing it as a form of labor and using language to uphold that belief. We had an understanding that it was a form of compensated sexual abuse and that people were doing it out of uh, necessity and desperation and on the other side out of predation. Uh, but now there is this added component of social conditioning and I accredit a lot of that. I blame that on sex work ideology. So I try to uh, always tell people, be mindful of the language that you use. And a lot of well-intended people have used that language because it has become the norm. They'll mm -hmm. say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm against sex work. How do we help sex workers? And I say, well, the first thing that you can do is stop legitimizing the abuse by using labor language. Because, you know, inadvertently, you, you will condition the next person to believe that that is a labor issue. And when you reduce it right down to a labor analysis, you forget everything else. You erase all of everything and it's okay, it's work. Now, how do we make it safe work? Right. And, and that's so right. problematic because we need to shift away from that concept of, of you know, um, one-sided, non-mutual, coercive sex as labor. It, it's not. So language totally. is always that's so That's powerful. such a key battleground is the question of is this legitimate work you mm -hmm. know if you if you can win the argument that this is a legitimate job then it, it kind of affects everything you've kind of won the the moral high ground so to speak yeah and so that's such a, a critical place to to debate this issue and to discuss this issue and again part of the reason why i think your voice on this matter is is so important people talk about the economy of prostitution in a way that almost suggests that prostitution is like inventing money. It's like mm -hmm. the economy of pro like prostitution doesn't invent that money already exists. So how is that money being, why is that money being deployed to give basic survival, you know, life sustenance to certain demographics of people in our society. Can't we figure out a better way to do that without having to subject them to the violating experience of prostitution? And the flagrant normalization and acceptance of this is so present all around us and um, that it's hard for it not to affect the psyche of most people. So, you know, for me, like one of my really healthy and life giving outlets is going surfing. And um, I remember being out surfing at one of my favorite breaks and uh, these guys talking amongst themselves openly in the lineup around a lot of other people they didn't know about their favorite place to go get quote a rub and tug, their favorite massage parlor. There was no shame, no stigma. It was, it was actually like a boasting of like, um, aren't I something, you know, manly to, to not only be going out and getting a, a quote rub and tug, but to kind of have a commanding knowledge of the best place to go do it. it it, it was so having been in this work for so long, it was just, it just put me on tilt. Like, wow. Like it's so the, um, the way that the normalization of this has seeped into our conscience with such flagrant disregard for the experience of the people in it is a massive indictment against the state of our culture and of our world and of manhood and all of these things. So for us, like when we get, you know, a lot of this backlash that you're familiar with um, as well, being on Twitter and, you know, we get it from outlets who claim the moral high ground on sort of like all things dealing with society and see us as the offenders of that. It, it's, for me, it's just, it, 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 
it does, it bears no significance because you're so utterly disqualified from the conversation by virtue of your absurd view of all of this. And so it's produced in me this really deep hatred of our culture. Like I just absolutely despise the current culture that we live in. I love humans, but we have so much work to do on this issue and in this space. Um, I wanted in the limited time that we have together, I really wanted to, because you're coming from Canada, I really wanted to get your thoughts about the indigenous populations there. From what I understand, um, the indigenous populations of Canada represent 4.8% of the population, but they also are 50% of the people who are uh, victimized through prostitution. Is that, I'm not completely sure if that's accurate. No, you're okay. spot on. I was very impressed that you knew that okay. statistic off the top of your head because most people don't. And, and yeah, that's very powerful to understand the overrepresentation that's happening. It's alarming. Yeah. So what's going on with that? What is happening there? Same thing, I think, uh, with colonialism and um, this forcing of Indigenous populations to join uh, a Eurocentric concept of society, I think that they have also not been immune to the normative effect of sex work ideology. So I wouldn't say it's to the same degree as um, others, but there's definitely, you know, the, especially with our past of having residential school systems, there's been uh, a lot of intergenerational trauma and a lot of breakage of the family unit and those uh, generational links. And so there's been a lot of loss in their community of culture and of teaching and of uh, coming together as one, as a people. Mm -hmm. And so that has made a lot of young indigenous people, which are our fastest growing population in Canada, very, very susceptible, especially once they are moving to these urban centers and cities, they become very, very susceptible to um, being conditioned with sex work ideology, especially given racism and a lot of the added vulnerability that they face in Canada being of an indigenous heritage. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's very alarming. And you know, it, it, it frustrates me because uh, we don't talk about the indigenous perspective, because I think when we actually start talking about it, we can really see the harm. We in Canada don't see indigenous people into our brothel systems. They just are not there. There's the odd one who might pass for a different ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, Thai, oftentimes, is what they will market themselves as. Brazilian. You won't see an Indigenous woman in a brothel or in, you know, quote-unquote, high-end escorting advertising herself as Indigenous because she is more likely to face violence. Uh, she'll be, you know, bartered with for her her asking price, uh, told that she is not worthy of those top dollar rates, um, you know, more likely to be murdered as they are. I think it's something like, I can't remember exactly if it's six times or 12 times, but they're at, Indigenous women are at a much higher rate than every other population in Canada being murdered. Is that because people feel like they can get away with it or is there? I think so. Yeah. It's racism is so embedded in our our society in Canada and we don't talk about that. Mm. You know, we're seeing a lot of this talk around truth and reconciliation and honoring the indigenous peoples. And um, again, like many things, it's to my understanding, a lot of lip service. You know, we have uh, 231 calls to justice uh, and not many of them have been implemented. And it's just kind of been, from my understanding, again, just a, a document that's here. We've done the work. We've mm -hmm. had the the conversations. We've drafted the report. And then that's kind of where things die. And it's the same thing with prostitution, too. We have all these task force. Sorry, maybe not prostitution, but trafficking. We have all these task force. We have all these meetings. We have all these you know, missions and goals. But then when it actually comes time for action, people fall short. And mm -hmm. You know, I don't blame people heavily for that because it seems like such an insurmountable problem that they just don't know where to start and they feel very intimidated. And it comes back to that uh, concept of how can I as one single person change this? But it's forgetting that, you know, one drop in the bucket multiplied by millions is an overflowing bucket. So we all can offer something. We all can do something. 
And uh, I try not to obviously speak on behalf of Indigenous people because I'm not, but I try with every opportunity I can to elevate their voice. Mm. And I'm very, very fortunate that um, a lot of Indigenous exited women are close friends of mine. Uh, you know, some that have talked about 25 years of street exploitation and of the names that they were called and the treatment that they received. And, Horrible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the work that they're doing now, like so powerful and because it's also still very taboo in their society. It's quite, uh, it's quite odd because, you know, in the, the Eurocentric side of things, we are celebrating sex work ideology and in the Indigenous community, even though it is impacting them, they don't celebrate it. Mm -hmm. You know, they still denounce it. They still say this is, is harming us. But, um, you know, it, again, I think people just feel lost. And so we do need to turn to those Indigenous people and we need to uh, free them from that shame that they feel talking about this issue so that they can continue doing that good work. And, um, you know, someone I, I always talk very highly about and um, we interviewed her in the film that we're doing, Labeled. Her name is April Eve Weiberg, and just a powerful activist who survived, um, you know, trafficking within Canada, trafficking uh, through U.S. organized crime syndicates, being marketed, like I said, as uh, Brazilian, East Asian, mm. any way that they could kind of package her. And she exited that uh that environment and has gone on to be a grassroots founder for an, an organization that you know speaks to the indigenous perspective on sexual exploitation and and the stolen sisters and brothers and exploited indigenous people. So, you know, I'm I'm very fortunate that um, I get to live and work amongst indigenous people, and I just have so much respect for them because they're doing such powerful work. But you know, we often don't highlight what is happening to them and how they are overrepresented in trafficking mm. and, and undoubtedly in lower castes, so to speak, of prostitution, like street exploitation. I think this whole conversation just kind of, you know, it just kind of um, elevates the importance and the significance of the, the more fundamental question of what does it mean to be human? And um, I know that you know, we get feedback all the time from people who listen to our podcast and are deriving, finding solidarity in these conversations. Because for those of us who have been sort of like awakened in our conscience and in our spirit to um, the, the injustice of commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking, um, it's... It can be a, an alienating or lonely space to navigate because it does feel oftentimes like we are living in this sociopathic world where, you know, good, evil is called good, good is called evil, you know, um, right side up is upside down. It, it's, it's so, our world is so convoluted right now. And um, so I'm super grateful for you joining us and just the opportunity for us to st continue to invite people into a conversation about what does it mean to be human and then the ability to see this issue through that lens of like, this is not what we want for ourselves. It's not what we want for our daughters. It's not what we want for our society regardless if somebody is making money off of it. And so I'm just, yeah, always, I feel reinvigorated in the, the fight to continue this message and, um, and advocating for a world where people who are marginalized in some way or impoverished or have, you know, um, toxic debt or any other m number of vulnerabilities aren't faced with having to sell themselves as a decision. And um, so, yeah, any, any final thoughts, Andrea, before we wrap this up? Well, just appreciation for the work that you do, you know, and I know a lot of times people say, well, you're turning this into a moral issue. And I say, yeah, I am because it is a moral issue. And, you know, uh, I think that we have to go back to looking at, like you said, what is right and what is wrong. And there is some truth. There is, at the end of the day, 
what is true. Right. And what is true is that, you know, we know from the droves of women that are exiting and they may not speak publicly publicly because of the backlash and you know, the silencing and the vilification, but we do know, especially you and I who, you know, we've had many, many years of speaking with survivors and being in this space, we know that the work does matter. And we know yeah. that even if we can't overcome it and end it immediately, which everyone always says to me, you're never going to end this. And I say, maybe I won't, but I will be the voice of resistance. And that is so important. And the more people that we have that are resisting that, that's the counter narrative. And that's what then creates the next legion of, you know, warriors, so to speak. And I would rather, um, take the hits and take the, totally. the backlash and everything and know that I'm fighting on the right side. I'm on the side of the light. Yeah. I'm not there with the rapists. I'm not there with the sexual coercers. I'm not there with the misogynists. I'm with the people that are fighting for the people. And so, you know, I'm just so grateful for the work that you do. And likewise, yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. No, thank you so much for coming. We, we really honor and respect your work. And I also would rather be part of the resistance than a part of the delusional masses that are perpetuating the status quo of this very fallen world that we live in. So uh, thanks everyone for joining and tuning into this podcast. These conversations are never easy, but um, I think are important. So um, until next time, All right, thank you so much. Thank you. You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at exodusgrid.com. And join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.